Network. Hello. Welcome to another edition of the Valhalla Movement Podcast. And you might recognize a face here. Maybe. If you've watched any of our other videos, uh, today we are speaking to Lawrence <laughs> Migliallo. And before we get to him, though, we need to cover one key topic. And that key topic is going to be the Valhalla Agency. So um, a lot of you guys have been asking us, what is the Valhalla Agency? Is it, can I get hired? Can I, can, can I hire you guys? Well, the truth is you could do both. Um, so the Valhalla Agency is really springing out of the fact that the Valhalla Movement really has a strong marketing arm and team. We're really good at putting together websites. We're really good at putting together videos, photos, graphics, social media management, systems design, like you know, getting your IT systems up or making your calendar sync with a scheduler or uh, your accounting systems now that we're getting together. Like All these things are all things that we really excel at. The online world is something that is kind of um, native to us, but not necessarily native to change makers as a whole. People who are really looking to create change in the world often don't tend to have the best marketing teams and the best uh, online teams. And so we wanna change that. We believe that changing part of the culture is going to come with changing the face of where people are getting this information. And there is no doubt that people are getting most of their information today from the internet. So. We are change makers for hire here at Valhalla. Basically, you can hire us to do the work that you want to do online, but only if you're basically a social entrepreneur or a social enterprise of some kind. So we only want to work with, with people who we really believe in and who kind of are perpetuating the, the businesses and ideas and, and philosophies that the Valhalla movement believes in. Now, the same applies to the people we want to hire. So we are have made a decision to only hire within the groups of people who believe as well uh, as, as much as us the things that we believe in terms of making sustainability mainstream and you know go read our mission page or manifesto or whatever but the idea is that we have a good amount of talent in our team but we would love to outsource that so you can not only apply to have us help you but you can have uh, apply to actually help us and then therefore help our clients in a sense be a part of that team and this is trying you know this is part of an effort to try and get more organizations working alongside us, uh, work to help more organizations, as well as more work to employ more people and make this all financially more viable for everyone involved as well. So I say this because today we've got Lawrence Migliello, but as you could possibly have heard over the last little bit, he's actually in India right now. And we're going to get to that in a second, but he's in India because of Basically, he's volunteering and helping through kind of the Valhalla agency kind of mindset, right, with online tactics for something called Barefoot College. So he's in India. Fucking yes. Let's do this. Thanks for being on the podcast, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So um, definitely, uh, I got a call about, um, I guess today would be about maybe five weeks ago. We were in the middle of a Valhalla meeting. And um, and they wanted to fly me out so that I can help them with a crowdfunding uh, fundraiser. Mm. And uh, they, you know, they recognized that as successfully as possible. They thought it would be, you know, a perfect opportunity to bring someone who is not only a marketer but someone who is uh, really ambitious and passionate about creating social change. So it's not just like we're any type of marketer. You know, but we're the type of marketer that can go to a remote village in the middle of the desert, uh, make lots of friends, become a part of the community, and really kind of like see eye to eye with uh, some of the methodologies that uh, these NGOs live with. You really have to be open-minded because there's a lot of top-down approaches, as we like to say, mm -hmm. which you know uh, people are realizing is is a bad approach to just dump schools and dump hospitals on villages and say, oh, this is charity. What tends to happen is that the uh, the actual grassroots community, the people who live there, they don't know how to maintain these top-down approaches, so they're always dependent on the people who provide them. They're always mm. dependent on the UNICEF or on the um, uh, you know those big guys. The, the aids that are coming in from from 
you know, uh, I hate to say, I, I don't know, I won't even say first world, basically Western world or Western aid kind of comes into some of these areas, let's say, and then they have exactly like, no idea how to deal with that. And I've seen it firsthand, Mark. It's, it's actually really scary. I've been to villages uh, in Nepal in particular where it's like there's a, there's a fantastic school. It's, it's well built and they have a solar system uh, that's connected to the computers and the modem router and the lighting system. And then all of a sudden this, the solar system jumps and no one knows how to fix it in the entire village. And the only way to get <laughs> oh to this village God. is by an 11-hour bus ride from the capital. So it's like they're totally screwed, and um, mm. and it's just it's not sustainable. So what the barefoot does is the barefoot trains rural uh, grandmothers who usually are illiterate or semi-illiterate on how to develop the solar system, from developing the circuit board to attaching it to a control box and attaching that to a solar panel, installing the solar panel to the roof, and then. Uh, attaching the entire system to a series of lights. Wow. So if the system breaks, they're able to maintain it, they're able to repair it, and it's totally a grassroots level uh, project. So the entire community gets empowered because they don't just see these you know, Westerners coming and helping them. What they see is a community grandmother developing a solar system. So mm -hmm. it actually creates new role models in the community as well. Yeah. Which is incredibly empowering. Okay, so, so let's back up here for a second for context. Where is Barefoot College? I mentioned in India, but where? How long has it been kind of running or give or take? And then, like, where are these grandmothers coming from? Because I know the answer to this, but let's, maybe let's let the listeners know. Definitely. So the campus itself is located in the middle of the Rajasthani desert in a village called Talonia. So 40 years ago, uh, the founder, Bunker Roy, uh, left his Ivy League Delhi school and he just wanted to uh, dig wells and what he realized when he was digging wells was that uh, these villages had everything that they needed to be self-sufficient. What they needed was just someone to believe in them and someone to say you know how to dig a well so go and do it. You know how to be the, 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 you know, the, the community shaman so go and do that and, and have you know, courage and, and passion to, to basically establish your own community and develop it from the grassroots mm. rather than let the villagers think that they always need help from the outside. So anyways, that's basically uh, where the Barefoot College is. Where we get our students, so where we get our trainees uh, is uh, from all over the world. Uh, we've touched base with 68 different countries and the most places, uh, the most basically the, the, the poorest villages in the world uh, and then they, they arrive in the community and they line up all the grandmothers and all the mothers who are over the age of 35 because in the rural you can be a grandmother at 35 <laughs> and they ask yeah and then they ask the community to vote on who are the best community leaders among all these women so the community votes for the women and then the women come to India to train for six months using um, you know, sign languages and, and color coordination and using uh, practical, um, practical exercises on, uh, on how to develop the solar system. And so within six months, they're totally qualified to go back to their community as new women, as empowered women, with all the instruments and with all the, the skills to set up their own solar system. Okay, and so... These women are coming from around the world, literally South America, China, whatever, any, any, any country, basically, the, some of the remote villages. They learn how to set up these systems. Now, all of this is paid for by Barefoot College, correct? All of this is basically charity kind of money that's coming in from other places that is kind of covering all of these costs, or are there costs uh, involved for the, these people? So, yeah, the Barefoot College funds itself... Um, in large part by the, uh, I might get this wrong, but it's, it's essentially the Indian government that gives them quite a large grant per grandmother. Mm. Uh, aside from that, though, there's a lot of private donations that come in, and that basically holds up the Barefoot College. Uh, you know, there are sustainable businesses that have uh, branched off from the Barefoot College. So there's like a craft department that is called Haveli uh, Crafts, and, and they're a self-sustaining enterprise now. There's also um, another association of 
solar cooker engineers that have also branched off because now they have uh, a lucrative uh, business structure. Mm-hmm. So the Barefoot College is always trying to basically self-sustain itself. But right now, uh, the solar program where we develop grandmothers to become solar engineers, that is still funded mostly by donations. And so that's, you know, that's why this crowdfunding campaign that I'm, I'm hosting and, and managing is pretty of, the, of the whole crowdfunding campaign has $4 million to give away in bonuses and matching. So basically, if we outperform in one week, we're given like a grant of five thousand dollars. Or if we outperform another week, then we might get you know like ten or twenty thousand dollars. So they're giving out a lot of cash in an effort, I guess, to you know um, propagate their own name, which is uh, the Skull Foundation. So we're very grateful to the Skull Foundation for for hosting this event and choosing us to be a part of it. Yeah. So for for those of you guys who are listening, um, you guys can can take part in two ways. So obviously, you can donate. You can go to it's Crowd Rise, and the link will be in the description below. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like, you know, there are foundations out there that are trying to do what they can to empower other foundations as well. And that's kind of what the school foundation seems to be all about. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is, um, you can actually become a fundraiser on this platform. What I mean by that is that, for example, if you go to the campaign, you'll see Lawrence Migliello and you'll see that he helped raise some of the money maybe through the Valhalla networks and other uh, his own personal networks and stuff. So you can actually kind of sign up to help raise money for Barefoot College if any of this is making sense to you, obviously. Um, so tell me a little bit more about, about Barefoot College. Tell me a little bit more about India because this is not your first time to India. This is You had con- gone to India and heard about Bare- Barefoot College uh, a while ago now. Um, and then you kind of revisited, and now you're there for the third time. So tell me a little bit more about life in India. Tell me a little bit more about what it's like to be there um, and how it's inspiring to to go to Barefoot College and stuff. Um, yeah, so basically, um, I love I love living in this village because you have everything you need. You have access to clean water, uh, to a well-rounded you know vegetarian meal three times a day and good air, good people, and there's Wi-Fi. So <laughs> I, I call Wi-Fi, it the village life, say. although I know that... Not, yeah, <laughs> I call it the village life, although I know that a lot of villages don't have uh, these sort of standards, but it's, it's a great lifestyle if you guys ever want to come and visit the campus. Uh, we're always accepting visitors, and uh, there's a volunteer platform if you want to apply for that. What the Barefoot College is to me, though, is a little bit more, right? It's... Um, as one of the co-founding members of Valhalla, I, I kind of you know bring Valhalla here as, as a supporter, because I have to pay homage to it. So uh, there was a point in my life when you know Valhalla didn't even exist, and I was uh, still in university working at a bank, and I didn't even want to travel anymore because I had made up my mind that I was going to finish becoming an actuary so I can become that Wall Street mogul and just make my parents happy. My, but my friends, though, they, they really uh, persuaded me. And they're like, Lawrence, you have to come with us to India. We need you. You've traveled before. Uh, we need <laughs> you to come. And I was like, sorry, guys. I, I got to finish my semester. But what had happened was on my birthday, I got my car broken into. Uh, I lost a lot of things, like my laptop, uh, some really expensive earphones, and a bunch of things. And what I got in the mail from the insurance company was a check that was enough to get me to India and back and I said you know what fuck it let me do it so I told my friends I'm like there's one wild card I have and it's that we have to go to the Barefoot College so and how we did you heard of that and like you just like I don't even know how you heard like I know you went I know you had this mission to go there but where did you even hear about Barefoot College in any way shape or form did, was it just because you were googling India or like uh, I don't know <laughs> I don't know, like what did, what happened? How the hell did you find stumble across this? There's actually a really good uh, TED talk by the by the founder of uh, the Barefoot College, Bunker Roy. Mm. So he talks for 17 minutes about um, about the solar program and about how he became uh, the founder and and how he made his decision in life to do this. And that was you know is totally inspirational. I would say it's one of the best TED talks out there right now. Mm. Uh, so that's. You can just Google TED Talk Bunker Roy, and that's literally what brings about two thirds of all the volunteers to the Barefoot College. It's that TED Talk. Wow. 
but um, but yeah, so basically, like when I was here, um, I speak fluent Spanish, and usually a third of the solar mamas come from countries in Latin America. So when I was in that classroom with uh, you know these uh, forty women from ten to fifteen different countries around the world, uh, all speaking a different language, I sat down with uh, with the Latin Americans and and being able to just communicate with them and listen to their story like real human beings and not just seeing them from like a screen or from a video uh, you know having someone narrate their story I was actually able to empathize personally with them mm -hmm. and it was something that you know kind of like destroyed me inside but at the same time rebuilt me and gave me the courage that I needed to go back home and turn my life around and jump on board with Mark with the Valhalla movement and I've never regretted anything ever since then yeah yeah, man, yeah. what a story that <laughs> that was. So me and Lawrence went to the same high school, um, but we were in different grades. So I was a, I'm a year older than Lawrence, uh, and we didn't we never really hung out. We knew of each other definitely. My neighbor uh, was good friends with Lawrence, and I would see him every once in a while. I think we played basketball or whatever every time and time again or whatever. But we didn't we didn't hang out not because of I don't know we just you know you don't know people and high school is a very different place than when when you grow up and be older and stuff right. But um, we ended up kind of... It just didn't happen, yeah. Yeah, it just didn't happen. It's just not like there was nothing about it. It just didn't happen. Um, and then we ended up meeting when the Occupy movement was starting to kick off. And then it kicked off in Montreal. And at the time, I was basically a fake it till you make it uh, journalist. I wasn't working for any, any outlet. I just had a camera and some nice equipment. And I was filming. I was I, I was just like a, a you know uh, kind of uh, just running gun kind of documentary style filmer who's like hey I'm gonna, I'm just gonna document this I don't know what I'm gonna do with it and I never really did all that much with it but I did kind of put out some key pieces things like David Suzuki going to uh, Occupy Montreal got I don't know fifty thousand hits on on YouTube so I was happy right like all of that happened and I actually ended ended up seeing Lawrence and we shook hands and I, and he was. He just looks stunned. I, I, I like I. If, I have the video still of him and his interview, <laughs> and just how stunned he looked. Of like he was just trying to absorb what was happening, and I guess personally in my life, through documentaries, through learning where money came from, through a whole lot of stuff like that, I kind of I had already jumped knee deep into this world. So when I saw Occupy spring up, it was like this was just part of what was happening at the time. But I feel like it kind of shocked. Lauren, like I feel like there was something that was that was smacking Lawrence in the face that I don't know if he had fully grasped or considered earlier than that. And um, I mean, and this, this am I wrong to say that? Yeah, this is totally. No, no, yeah, no, no, this, no, this, this is before we were for college. This is before, like yeah. he was in school. He was working at the bank, um, and he was just there. And he was on his lunch break from the bank, and he was and he was checking out what the yeah. hell was going on, right? And I had a tie on. Yeah, he had like a suit and tie on, and he was at Occupy Wall Street or Occupy uh, Montreal or whatever. And it was like he totally didn't fit into the, the typical person that you would expect there, uh, which I, I, in fact, feel is part of the problem. And so we actually started got, getting to talk. I interviewed him, and then we were like, you know what? We should consider going to Occupy Wall Street. And we were talking about like all the coverage that we were seeing on Facebook. And you know, at the time, Facebook wasn't so censored, so a lot of this news was really spreading. And uh, I don't even know how it happened, but like, what is it? Like a week later or something? Like a couple of days later, not long after yeah. this, we were like, yeah, you know what? We're going to go. And we actually jumped in a car, went down to Occupy Wall Street together and started filming that. And then it was like, it was almost like Lawrence had now seen, had been exposed to this fake story of, of who I was kind of becoming, which was this journalist, but now he became the journalist too. And so... We were both there, you know, documenting what was going on. We ended up, I, we ended up interviewing. I think it was Don King, and and we just we were at Occupy Wall Street. Like we were just having a good time. We were learning. We were we saw the human megaphone, and we were we were just getting so inspired by what was going on. And all of Valhalla, all of this stuff of like us moving in a house together, all these things, basically sprung out of just taking action and faking until we make it. In a sense, and I can only imagine that organizations even like barefoot college have this incredible story that just comes out of it just comes out of the ether sometimes you know i don't think bunker roy when he was a little kid was like you know what i'm going to start a 
I'm going to start a program that teaches rural moms and women how to build solar systems. But it just, sometimes you just fall ass backwards into the things that you do in life. And man, I can say the same for, I can definitely say that's the case for me. You know, it's not like I, I thought well, I'd be running a Valor Movement Foundation uh, and be a part of this necessarily. But I could tell you that I was always going to be a part of the change. And I feel that Lawrence felt the same way. Now, my question to you, Lawrence, is, how much of how much of that change was also inspired by the fact that you had traveled the world and seen something different than what kind of you would experience at home? You know what I mean? Because at home, clearly the experience was like, hey, go get a job, become a guy on Wall Street, or become an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer. And we don't we never really feel the exposure and the struggle that is being kind of felt outside of our environment. Uh, and and sometimes outside of our environment does even means like like in the poor neighborhoods of our own town, okay? But the idea of like going to travel completely changed that for me. So how mm-hmm. do you feel about traveling and, and what that creates in terms of a mindset? Whether it be traveling to Occupy Wall Street and just leaving your home from that perspective or whether it be traveling to India or, uh, you know, Southeast Asia or whatever it is. To talk to me a little bit about traveling and why, like, do you recommend it to people? Well, I highly recommend it to people, for sure. Um, I mean, I traveled a lot, and Occupy definitely affected me in a way that was different than what I saw when I was traveling across Asia and South America. I think what I saw at Occupy that really stunned me was a working community with a common cause. Um, so that's that's for Occupy. That's what I, I really saw Occupy as a springboard. It was basically there was little outlets within the community. So if you actually spent the time to walk inside the park and not just around the, um, the fringe perimeter, which is what is. a lot of people did. Yeah. Yeah. You would see that there was, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was um, laid off firemen or there was uh, ex-veterans or there was uh, students uh, who with master's degrees who still didn't have jobs. And so they were trying to basically uh, consolidate people of the same issues and problems so that they can create their own uh, little organizations so they can strive to do the things that they want to do with the skill sets that they had. And Mm -hmm. out of that was born Valhalla because we met other people from Occupy that had the same kind of vision as us, right? But I think that in traveling, one of the first things you realize, though, is is a a new mindset for happiness because let's say like the first place I went to was Thailand and it's not a very difficult place to travel because it's, they cater very well to tourists. But you just see people with so much less than you and still be able to maintain a level of happiness that can sometimes be even higher than some of the folks that we live with back at home. You know, it's like you look at some of these, at some of these kids and you just think like, wow, if my, my friends were in that in that body living this kind of life right now, they would be miserable, you know? And it's just like, but then what is happiness? You know, it's, it's totally um, dependent on, on your perspective with life and, and what it is that you hold of, of true value. So when you, when you begin to travel more, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna spoil it because it's, you know, spiritual experiences are personal experiences. So you have to go and see it for yourself. And, and I say spiritual because those are the things that will change you, they'll kind of like shift you. You're gonna feel it in your gut. It won't be an analytical, process it'll be more of an emotional one mm. and i with that i guess i'll just leave people because i really want them to experience it themselves you know i don't want to yeah i mean yeah. They're, they're gonna have to experience it themselves no no doubt right uh, you will not feel this shift like you like you can travel to america uh and you can travel to europe and you can travel to certain places and you will definitely feel some version of an emotional shift in just the experience of traveling and lugging your stuff around particularly if you're backpacking and if you do it in a level of like going alone or something like that, like, you know, the first backpacking trip I ever took was 100% alone for three and a half months. Um, and it's not like, not everyone has the courage of doing that. I'm not alone in doing it. There's tons of people out there and doing it. And every single one of them seems to say the same message, which is traveling is super awesome for opening your mind. And mm-hmm. I want to kind of touch upon that, that opening of the mind kind of, element because this is really where Valhalla and different organizations 
and also visionaries, people like Elon Musk or people who create multi-million dollar corporations and even business people, what they're doing, the real magic of, of life at the, at, is kind of opening your mind, right? The real magic of life is being there to receive the things that are kind of coming towards you, right? And experiencing them not for just what they are, but also how they feel and then how, how they can kind of become your passion and drive you to make, you know, to go in a particular direction. And not every person has to go in the direction of like saying, hey, I'm going to, I'm part of a nonprofit. And I hate the word even nonprofit. I, I want to call them for purpose. You don't have to work for a for purpose company or organization to, to do good things or to be a part of the change that you want to see in the world, right? Or to, to build, to live a better life. We all have inside of us, however, the emotions of what are what is happening around us, the emotions of of how our socio political or socioeconomic systems are affecting all of our lives. Right? They're affecting our decisions. They're affecting what we are doing consistently, um, and they affect our purchases. They affect how we deal with people, um, and sometimes they affect like our responses to to different. Um, scenarios or injustices that we feel are dealt upon us. And it's creating this climate right now, in my opinion, that is getting more and more uh, charged up. It feels like Occupy came out of the fact that because information is flowing faster and faster and faster, what we're doing is actually consuming not only more mental kind of ingestion of this, but we're actually consuming more of the emotional feel of the problems of the world. Now, it used to be that only if you turned on CNN or whatever, uh, MSNBC or the news, that you would hear some of these bad news items. But now, we've got a mixture of good news, bad news, no matter what we're looking at. Well, even if you don't watch the news, if you go on Facebook or if you go anywhere, you're going to hear the news in a weird way. It's almost like we can no longer escape it. And it's that it's accelerated our emotional... Um, feelings towards everything and then this intake, this drastic amount of stuff that is coming our way and this massive amounts of overload of information. And if you feel this way, because I sometimes do, um, I think one of the best things you can do is sit there and commit to one particular thing and just do something for it. Now, I asked this because I asked the question earlier of like, or I'm bringing this up because I asked the question earlier of well, how the hell did you decide Barefoot College? And in, it's the same way that you decide anything in life, right? You decide that, hey, I'm going to take part in something, no matter what it is, that I'm just interested in. And there's so many people that there's so much information, there's so much going on out there, there's so many different places that they want to travel to, that it creates this decision paralysis where they go to none of them right? They don't go and support mm. any of the causes that they believe in particularly, or they don't go and visit or travel to any of the places because they have this decision paralysis of not knowing what to do. And therefore, sometimes what we end up doing is taking the easiest choice, like the one that's fully decided for us, like an all-inclusive. If we say all-inclusive because we want to relax, yes, that's great in certain scenarios, but there are definitely people who don't want to relax, but still go to the all-inclusive because they just don't know what to do and how to do it. And we're, we, we're faced with a certain fear of making the wrong decision. How do you feel about the decisions that you've made? Because not all of them are the best for other aspects of your life, right? Like not every decision you've made is the best thing that you could have done for your wallet. Not every decision you made is a thing that your parents would have wanted you to make. But you mentioned something earlier, which is like, I don't have any regrets since I've done this. Since you've done what? What it, What exactly did you do? Like on a, you, you described what you did on a, on a kind of physical level. But what did you do on an emotional level that now kind of has enthralled you into this lifestyle and this career, in a sense, of being a for-purpose kind of guy? You know what I mean? Well, first of all, I just want to say I love the play on words for-purpose. That's <laughs> that's really clever. We should start using that. I, I'm going to start using that. All the time. <laughs> I use it all the time now. I wrote it. I've been writing it kind of everywhere I go, and I'm. So Valley is more. a for purpose. Yeah, we're not just a nonprofit or NGO. We're a for purpose organization. Yeah, and you know, purpose is the key word. Uh, when I got back to Canada from India uh, after visiting barefoot, I knew that 
I had way too many attachments to be able to make, you know, one clear decision. Uh, like you're saying, you know, there's decision paralysis, and I wanted to eliminate that completely. So how do you eliminate decision paralysis? Decision paralysis happens because you're attached to many physical things in life. And so I was attached to living with my parents, so I moved out. I was attached to uh, my girlfriend, so I broke up with her. I was attached to my job at the bank, so I quit my job. Uh, I was attached to the academia standard, you know, of being in school and basically, you know, impressing those, those peers that I had. So I dropped out of school. So I basically alleviated myself of everything that I was committed to so that I can focus from a, a pure space, a space where, where my true purpose would come from. When I say my true purpose, I mean it would come from the space in my heart. So what is, what is my destiny? What is it that I am supposed to do? What is it if you close your eyes and you become nothing, if you, just be, you don't become Mark, you don't become a human on the planet, you just, you're just this pure effervescent space, what is it then? that you're going to do, what decision will you make then? Mm -hmm. And so that's how, that's how I decided to, you know, to, to go on to Valhalla and work step by step. And after that, what you need to do, because obviously you can't do this every time, you can't just drop your life and then go back to that space and then say, okay, now where do I go? <laughs> you, you could, but the, the, more, the more practical way of doing that is through meditation, uh, which is something that, that I practice every morning and that a lot of people at Valhalla practice every morning so that you don't get that decision paralysis, so that you come back to the base. Mm -hmm. You come back to your purity, yourself, the, the true I, and then you live through that. You mm -hmm. live through your heart space. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you live through your heart space, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll create divine things, you'll create beautiful things. And Gandhi likes to put it in terms of satyagraha, which is the truth force. So to live through truth force. And, mm. and I'm really happy that we have that in our, because, you know, I wouldn't want us to, to operate any other way. We, we operate here at Valhalla through, through truth. And so when we make all our business decisions and when we take up our new clients uh, and when we do things for our clients, it comes, it comes from that same space every time. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that. And, and I think what's really interesting is, is, and this is kind of what we've been swirling around, is the detachment. Because that's what happens when you travel. That's what happens when you go in certain of these scenarios. And then, you, and then you detach yourself completely. And that's when you kind of figure out who you are. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. everything that you were was defined in a weird way by other people. It was defined by like kind of what group you were in when you were in high school. Uh, what sport did you play? What did you identify with? Uh, what person did you hang out with? What area of, this, of, of the world did you live in? What town did you live in? What county? What household? Like all of these things kind of defined who you were. But when you're out as this kind of floating vessel out in the, about in the world where you know you own nothing include, other than maybe the bag on your back, okay, and the small amount of, of things that you're carrying with you, it really detaches yourself from that that kind of identity and then allows you to birth a new one. And then from there, you can attach yourself back to all those things. Like you mentioned, okay, I broke up with my girlfriend. I know you're back with that girlfriend, but it wasn't that you were detaching yourself. Or it's not that you wanted to break up with her per se, in my opinion. It seems like what you were trying to do is like, hold on, give me a space. Give me, give me a second to go make a, to pull out a blank white canvas here and then repaint some of these things. Just give me that time. And I think we all need that time. Very few of us take that time to sit there and think about it. And it's funny because meditation to me is very different than what meditation probably is to Lawrence. You know, I know Lawrence, for example, is enthralled with yoga and he loves, you know, he loves um, spending time doing all the craziest poses you can possibly imagine, uh, including some of the, you know, the more the, the standard poses and stuff. And for me, it's like yoga is great in many, many ways. But it's not necessarily my calling. It's not necessarily my method of meditation either. My method of meditation isn't the traditional sit down and and um, and sit there and just remove everything out of your mind. And like sometimes I do that, definitely. But I, I think I meditate more even just through pacing. Like part of my, you know, if, if anybody's ever watched me in any way, shape or form, okay, talk to people or be on the phone, I always pace. 
Okay, and if I'm having ideas, I'm pacing and I'm pacing and I'm pacing. And I'm doing the same pacing motion over and over and over and over and over again. And in a sense, that to me is meditation. That's a version of meditation that I bring into it. It allows me to have the clarity of doing something that I know is very intentionally meditation. You know, I have uh, an hourglass, for example, I use. I, I flip it around and I use that to stay focused on one thing. That's like another version of meditation for me. You know, so meditation... When you're listening to this, meditation is something that you define, not is defined by society. Um, and allowing yourself totally. to have if that, it's something that, that you come out of. Yeah, no, go for it. Yeah, and if you if it's something you come out of feeling you know refreshed and feeling anew, then that that's great. You know, if if it works for you, then it works for you. The yoga isn't for everybody. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it's gardening. For a lot of people, it's painting. It's writing poetry. It could be a number of different things. So, yeah, definitely, it's important to mention that because I tend to forget that. You know, like when I talk about meditation, I don't want people to feel left out just because they don't, you know, sit down in lotus and and start humming. You know, because maybe they're doing it when they're just taking walks every morning. A walking meditation is something that you know the Zen Buddhists really, uh, really mm. did a lot. They practiced a lot of. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. Part of it is that it. what's good about meditation as well, or something that you should consider in terms of a meditative practice, is that it is routine or regular, however. So it shouldn't be like meditation is not the, the once in, you know, once every couple of months that you do something like meditation. Yes, that is kind of meditation, but I think you'll, you'll see the benefits of doing it over an extended period of time or fairly regularly or almost daily um, because it will bring you back to that space and those emotions that you had in that one moment. So for example, listener, whoever you are, you're think about a time where you were at peace, right? Like you were, you were just happy and uh, everything was relaxing, generally probably quieter. Um, and you were just observing whatever is around you, whether it be people's faces, uh, maybe you're in a mall, maybe you're outside in nature. If you go back to that space regularly, would you imagine that that space is probably better for you and is going to make a better day on a day-to-day -day basis if you go back to it regularly versus only if you go back to it every once in a while? You know what I mean? So meditation, I think, makes an important... It, it plays such an important role in doing what you're going to do. And it's not just good for yourself. It's also good for the people around you, definitely. Because mm. people like to be around others who are more peaceful and meditative and, you know, less likely to create conflict because that, you know, that essentially will be, will be what will come from it, right? If you're, I like to say it's basically, it's, it, some people say, you know, we're, we're working to this, to this divine Buddhahood, which is where you're totally detached. You just, you're the Buddha, right? But it's like, I don't, I don't like to think of it that way because we're, you know, we're put in this reality so that we can experience things on this planet. So I like to see it as like, I do it every morning so that I have quick access to to that no mind, you know, to that no mindedness. So that when I have a conversation with someone, and all of a sudden, you know, there's there's a conflicting interest, uh, there's a problem, there's an argument that's about to start. It's very quick for me to, or it's at least easier for me to be like, hmm, what is the most Buddha-like thing I would do? Mm. You know, not create more conflict by, but by, you know, uh, acting through compassion or inclusion or trying to find out someone's real needs. So, yeah, like, um, yeah, basically that. And, I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's so hard and it requires so much practice to get there, right? That's a common mm -hmm. thing is, like, to get there. What is it? Where are you going? You know, it's like we're not trying to go anywhere because in yeah. trying to get somewhere, you'll never get there. Exactly. It's just about just forgetting that you're even getting anywhere. Yeah. And then you'll you'll be there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a, that reminds me of a quote which is happiness is not a destination, it's a way of travel. Right? To be happy, mm -hmm. to to live a life of purpose, to to do uh, the things that you want to do and to to kind of get to the point where you are living the life that you want to live, that happens right here right now. It doesn't happen when you're oh when I do this or when I do that. It's right here and right now. And I actually had this kind of pretty interesting insight, which is I, I talk a lot about inten intentions 
Um, it's like, if you intend something, then it will happen and the universe will conspire to make it happen, right? I say, uh, I have a quote that I literally say all the time, which is, through intentions, we are the architects of the universe. I think I need to have a create a follow-up quote to that, which is, to do that, however, you also need to trust the universe, right? And I, ha- I don't have the quote for it just yet, but the idea is that mm. a lot of what Valhalla does, a lot of what I do, I'm sure a lot, I know a lot of what Lawrence does is because we also trust that everything is going to work out the way it needs to work out and that we are going to face the challenges <laughs> when we need to face them, right? Yeah. It's, that's the whole thing is that we're just, we just trust it. We had no idea what we were going to do when we were moving in together. We had no idea what we were going to do on the land. We had no idea what we were going to do to make money. We have no idea what we we're going to do to do any of the things that we we're going to do. And yet all of them are happening weirdly enough, I, I almost say that none of it is almost happening because of us. It's Half of it is happening because of other people and just weird connections and the trust in our path and in the story. And as long as we stay consistent and true to it, as long as we live in that truth that you pointed out, right, that truth also manifests trust. Because if you live in truth, then you trust the universe will kind of give you back that truth and give you back the things that you need to see and hear in a clearest kind of form versus kind of the murky waters of trying to manifest things all the time, right? Like a lot of what life is kind of made out to be right now is what is the life you're going to make for yourself? And, and that's a pressure that is pretty uh, crippling. It's like, whoa, wait a second. I have to make something here. Like I was just born into this world. I didn't have the choice. And now all of a sudden, like all of, I went through all these things that I was running through the rat race. I, I totally forgot what the hell was going on about anything else. And now I had to make something of myself. That's crazy. Versus the other mentality, which is a mentality I've kind of adopted more is what is going to happen to myself more so than that? What am I going to experience versus create? And through the experience element, then I can create in in such a different way, right? It's like we're trying to create and and we're trying to, we got it backwards in so many ways. Uh, At least from my personal experience, we have it completely backwards. To create something, we must first experience and slow down and stop and observe and be present. Then we can create what we want to create versus trying to create something so that we can stop and be present and like retire with all the things that we want retirement to me, I always say, I always tell my mom, I'm like, I already retired. I'm, I'm not, I would retired from the rat race. That's what I've retired from, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. Word to that for sure. I am true, totally though. retired as well, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. It's like, I never understood. It's like, well, no, wait a second. You have to be 65 to retire. I'm like, what? Are you, what? Why? <laughs> like, what do you mean? I'm not, I'm not living. Like, I don't, yeah. I, I even don't want to even call what I do a career. It's like, that's, I just call it my life. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I do. I wake up in the morning every once in a while. I have to have a meeting for Valhalla. Every once in a while, I have to get on the phone with, if you want to call it a client or, or whatever, I have to do certain things. I have to take care of accounting. It's definitely things that suck. No matter what you're going to do, there's things that you have to do that aren't always fun. Um, and then there's always going to be a whole bunch of things that you do that are that are fun. And it depends really 100% on your attitude towards them, right? Like, mm. so what would, you, what would you suggest then? Yeah, go to the, I totally agree that, you know, there's the survivalist mentality, uh, which is where like, I need to, I need to keep my own so that I can go on doing the things uh, that I don't like doing so that eventually one day I can retire. And then there's the, uh, the mentality of faith, right? Cause you were, you were talking about trusting yep. the universe is yep. to me, just another form of faith. And that's what people mean when they say faith is just like trust and trust and love and trust in everything, you know? Um, so what, what would you say to the ones that, I guess are working, you know, a job that they don't like, uh, are super caught up in saving their money uh, and paying their mortgage right now that they're caught into. What's the, what, what do those people start with? I guess to, to try to live a more (sighs) retired life today. I, I, I think it's a combination of two things. I really do. I think the first thing they have to do is that have an attitude shift. The first thing you need to do is see everything you were seeing in a negative light, even the things that suck, right? Like I would consider that they suck, okay, in a positive light immediately. Like you have to be able to light switch and say, say the statement that you just said that sucked in a positive light or tell me the the, the positive side of that situation because that's where you're going to start seeing the positive side in other situations. 
The second thing I needed, I think they need to do is they have to go on a hero's journey. And the hero's journey is marked by a couple of key things. Yes, the journey itself of like going, you know, like whatever, crashing, burning, and then coming back up and rising out of the ashes in a sense and kind of... But really, the hero's journey is all about leaving your home environment. So here's your, here's your comfort zone. Leaving that, in zo- that zone, and it doesn't have to be leaving that zone physically. You don't necessarily need to leave your town, but you have to travel to a different space that is outside of their comfort zone and your, and your current mentality and experience it and learn from it in a way that is way more profound than you can ever learn from being inside of your bubble. It is, there is no doubt about the fact that if you, you cannot learn things that are outside of your bubble by being inside of your bubble. It's impossible. Yeah, so I just want to point out that that space can also be just, it could be accepting a job that has less, uh, less to pay you for it. Like uh, getting, receiving a lower salary, basically, is for some people enough of a, of a journey. Oh, yeah. It, it comes in a thousand and one different formats, whether it be backpacking to a foreign country, whether it be accepting a job, like you said, with a lower salary and something that just doesn't make any logical sense, but yet emotionally feels good. Um, basically, you have to do something that's going to follow your heart and make that decision and then commit to doing it and do it. If you do those two things, basically shift your attitude to seeing the positive, even in the negative. Okay, just point out some positive statements. So anything you're saying that is negative right now in your mind or in your verbiage, like, oh, fuck, it sucks to sit in traffic. Turn that into a positive, okay? Because I hate traffic too, but I started turning those things into positive. Oh, I said, it sucks to sit in traffic, but I have the opportunity of slowing down and looking and looking at the world around me versus having driven by it at 100 kilometers an hour, right? Mm-hmm. So I now have an opportunity to be in this space where I can observe things that I wouldn't have otherwise observed had there not been traffic like listen to a podcast or do whatever. I have more time to do those things. So we have to see the positive in the situation as the first step. The second step is you have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to do something, one thing. All I'm asking you to do is commit to one thing that you're going to do that is different than yourself. And in my opinion, my life is all about doing that over and 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 over over again consistently. (laughs) Terrible. And the more uncomfortable I get, (laughs) the more magic starts to happen. Like, I'm telling you, right now we're working on something called the Valhalla Villas, right? Our own, our very own housing um, development and kind of ideas inspired from Earthships, but really taking this to another level in mainstream. This is costing me essentially all my life savings and all the money that is coming towards me. And I'm getting massive bills that make me so uncomfortable when I have to pay them at times. And yet... Oddly enough, over the last couple of months, I've just been able to pay them over and over and over again somehow. I have no idea how. I have no idea where this money is coming from, but I'm trusting the universe. <laughs> I have a good attitude towards it. Like, so when I get it, the instant reaction in my, in my gut is negative emotion. I feel this weird, shitty feeling, and then I turn that into a positive. And I turn that, that negative emotion into a positive, and actually now it becomes a new normal. Let me give you another example of this. Think about how much money you make per hour in a sense, right? Everyone kind of boils down, oh, how much money do I make per hour? Now, imagine that right now, all of a sudden, snap of your fingers, you're making double that amount of money. It becomes the new baseline for you, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're never going to accept a job that's going to pay you less than that double salary because that is now your new baseline. It's your new confidence. It's your new, it's your new standard for how things are done. And that's why across culture... Things are different because our baseline is different in different areas, right? So certain people have a, in in North America, we have this level of cleanliness that is just kind of not upheld elsewhere in the world. Like we just, it's just insane some of the things that we do. And in other places there, they just don't consider that as nearly as much as we do. Okay. And, or in the same ways. And, and therefore they live with kind of a different baseline. So consider where your baseline is and then get out of it right? Consider where your bubble is and then get out of it. And then that's where the magic happens. So for me, when I, when I hear Lawrence's story, him being a part of Valhalla was getting out of his, his comfort zone. Him going to India was getting out of his comfort zone, right? Because he left the bank. He left the job. He left his parents. He left all those things and then kind of spent the time that it took to go and be a part of something that was scary. And in that scariness, he found 
that smile that is consistently <laughs> on his face. Um, and I think that's, that's, I mean, that's what I would say. What would you say? Like, is, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, definitely. You know, you got to start with the attitude thing, because if you <clears throat> are a negative person, then you'll, you know, you'll see the world in a negative, in a negative place. Like I, I remember we had, you know, uh, we have a community dog called Bear, and uh, initially it wasn't it wasn't necessarily supposed to be a community dog. It was supposed to be a gift for my parents, and um, and I did it, you know, for a number of reasons. I wanted them to uh, embrace a new creature as uh, as uh, you know a sign of uh, compassion and companionship, mm. and um, but they would just wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it because they were kind of stuck, I guess, you know. And I'll say it, they were kind of stuck in a negative mind frame. Uh, which I like to call uh, seeing the dog as piss and shit, rather than seeing the dog as a you know a cute animal, an animal that is going to reciprocate uh, love to you, an animal mm. that will give you companionship, that will give you company, that will receive you when you're home. Instead, they saw the dog as piss and shit. Lawrence is going to shit everywhere. Lawrence is going to piss everywhere, and that's you know that's a comparison I like to make with people who you know, uh, are more positive versus people who see the piss and shit and everything. <laughs> That's true. That's a great comparison. And I can, Im and I can attest to the fact that I don't always have the positive attitude, um, <laughs> on every scenario, including this one. I did not want a dog either. I don't see piss and <laughs> shit though. For me, it wasn't piss and shit. For me, it was about responsibility. It, to me, it's not about a responsibility. It was like a responsibility, not of cleaning up its piss and shit, but more the responsibility of like, I, if I want a dog, and I do want a dog, okay, but I want a dog that is free, that can run wild, that I can like let go on the leash and, and just have them have that that feeling and, and and like you know what I mean, like be a real wild dog. That's the kind of dog I want, and it would be in my my kind of dog would be a husky or even kind of a mix of what he is, a husky and Akita and stuff, and and something like that is my kind of dog. So I should love this dog, but when we first got it, I saw the responsibility of like, who's gonna walk it? Who's gonna feed it? Um, you know, uh, like I'm gonna I'm gonna leave to go to faraway lands for numerous months at a time. Like I can't, I don't want to take care of it at that moment. So for me, it, weirdly enough, I had a bad negative attitude towards towards the dog, and even now to this day, I still call him a shithead. Um, but Vivian will uh, will always say that she she's like, you know, you love him. And, I definitely, definitely care about him. I definitely would take the responsibility if I needed to. I definitely would always find a way to make sure that this dog is going to be safe because that's who I am. Um, do I want to be the person who has to wake up every morning and feed him or walk him? No. And that's, that's part of the reaction that I kind of, I guess I made clear. But my mind frame at that moment was negative and it did not serve me and it shouldn't have been that way. And I think over time, what I've decided to, what I've kind of become in a weird way is more accepting of everything in a, in a, in a, anything that is happening, I'm very accepting of it. And I actually take responsibility of it in a weird way. I also say that, the, you know, I have this saying that life is lived in the mirror. So any reaction that I'm having outside of me to other people is really the reaction that I would be having to myself. Right. So if other people do certain things where I hold them up to this, a certain standard, but really what I'm holding up to is my own standards and me being mad at myself if I was doing the thing that they were doing, for example. And that is a huge mindset shift when I can catch myself and say, wait a second, I am only mad at myself here. I am only mad at my own standards and my own way of thinking. And I have to open my mind and, and expand my bubble again to include this versus close it. And so I guess in a, in a general sense, it's how do you, how do you become somebody who is more um, living at ease? Well, it's by being more open and accepting definitely than being more closed. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Another thing actually that definitely. Um, and another thing is, okay, so we're talking about people, uh, we're talking about helping people who might be stuck in, in a in a stratosphere of like you know doing the same thing every day right because they want to pay their bills uh i think that eventually it, and it's happening we're going to get to a point where people are going to realize that your community needs certain things like you know it needs shelter it needs power it needs clean water it needs food it needs 
uh, you know, different types of services like education and, you know, daycares and whatnot, if you can just become a part of these services within your community, then eventually the community will learn to, uh, you know, to sustain you, to give back so that you can continue to exist doing the things that they need you to do. Mm. And as we become more decentralized, uh, which is, you know, which is where a lot of eco-villages and a lot of the communities that we're interested in are going, then I think we're going to need more of these people to, to like quit their jobs and say, I don't know how to install a solar panel, but I'm going to learn because if I'm the only person on this block that knows how to install them, then I'll be the only one that knows how to install them. <laughs> <laughs> and that could be of service and of value to people whether it be monetarily or not, whether it be totally. just on a social level of like, hey, you helped me and I love you. and Or whether it be like, hey, can and now you're the guy who knows how to install solar panels, I'll pay you to do it. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a commitment that needs to go into it. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm coaching now for a living, which is really interesting. And it's very different because now I actually am directly working with people on, on shattering limiting beliefs, right? I'm directly working with people to figure out where their bubble is and then move them outside of it and then give them a task that says, hey, get outside here, come over here, come over this way, actively. Like I'm doing this numerous times a week now um, and I'm doing it and it's be, and what I've really mm -hmm. recognized is, the, the, what I've recognized is that recognition and admission is the first step, like you know they, they say in AA meetings or whatever, to change. I, when I recognize that I get comfortable, that's immediately when I have to make a plan for change, right? The second I am doing a pattern that is comfortable and comfortable and comfortable, then I'm like, wait a second, no, you're too comfortable, get out of there. Wait a second, you're too comfortable, get out of there. And so I've created like almost a systematic way of doing that for myself, but I don't think that everyone does that um, as much as I do. And I think, at least for me, it has worked. So when people ask me, what do you do to consistently dream big and do these like take on these crazy projects i'm like well i think about crazy projects that are outside of me and then i commit to doing them and that's what you kind of you mentioned is um committing to also something just committing to anything that is happening around you right you know so is there one yeah. thing you're going out there and you just wish existed like how many times have we all had this idea of like oh my god i wish they made that like oh if, if they made that i would buy it you know, and I think the difference between an entrepreneur and the person who, uh, who just said that is that they just did that thing when they recognized that one, um, that one kind of area that was lacking or like, oh, wow, you know, this idea, I wish somebody did it. It's almost like, wait a second, what if somebody was me and taking that personal responsibility and being a part of that? And that's how Valhalla was born. Mm. So what are you what are you currently feeling on that on that uh, mindset? Like I'm always interested in this personally. I'm always I always kind of ask myself this question about other Valhalla members mm. and people around me. It's like, what is your current version of what do I want to be or what do I want to do? Like I did, definitely you went to Barefoot College and you're happy to do that, but now now what? How, where is this expanding to in your mind? I don't know that I've reached the place where, or the place yet where I'm like thinking about already expanding. I'm I'm very, uh, I'm still learning, you know, the ropes at the Barefoot College. Uh, to me, it's still it's still incredibly inspiring when I just you know go and visit these these mamas from eleven different countries and see them becoming invaluable to their community. You know, like that to me is it's still it's still feeding me energy, and uh, I don't know where I will I'll go from here, but. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, before this, before the barefoot, I always said to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if we can, like, eliminate uh, all the prejudice against people of different castes, people of different religions, pre people of different educational levels, and the Barefoot College does all of this. So I guess I'm just really grateful to, to be working here, man, because it's, it's amazing what they do. I mean, these grandmothers, they go back, and they have, like, at most a sixth-grade level, sixth level education, and... And they become the ones who illuminate their communities, not the government, the grandmothers do. Mm. So there's, like, there's a really incredible story um, that I'll say really quickly. It's basically uh, we trained some, uh, some women from Sierra Leone 
around the time where there was a lot of civil unrest. And we went to a village that had uh, no electricity, absolutely none. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we brought these women. They trained for six months. They became super mamas. They went back. They illuminated their community. I don't know how. They did like 10 or 12 homes. Physically uh, solar. And, and mentally, surely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then one day, the, uh, the minister of external affairs was driving by. And he saw that the village had light. And he's like, well, what is the meaning of this? This village never had light before. Now it's illuminated. So he gets out of the car. He walks into the village. And he's saying, you know, like, you know, um, who's responsible for this? Why is there light all of a sudden in this village? And the villagers point to these three grandmothers. And they're like, they're the ones who installed this. The minister can't believe his, what he's hearing, that these, you know, these three uh, illiterate women from some remote village were the ones that were capable of putting together everything um, and you know, taking care of the shipping, taking care of the installation, taking care of, uh, of the management of, uh, of monthly fees from the villagers so that they can sustain themselves. Mm. So the minister called the, uh, the president or the prime minister, I don't know how it works in Sierra Leone, and uh, you know, the, uh, the president or the prime minister got his entire panel to come to the village and offer this you know, big recognition, this big reward to these three illiterate grandmothers. And the grandmothers were just like, overwhelmed because they never thought in their lives that with the education that they had, they can be, you know, recognized and respected by all these aristocrats and all these elitist people. Mm. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be working for that. And I still haven't gotten over it. Uh, <laughs> you, maybe you, shouldn't, you don't, don't need to yet. get it over it. No, it? not yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think so as now, long as we're still doing that. Yeah. As long as you're being a part of that and being a part of the change, right? As long as you're kind of illuminating uh, parts of the world, whether it be physically or emotionally, um, then it's always going to be something that you're going to have fun doing, right? I wonder, um, man, that's such a good story. See, all of this is possible, guys. Just again, go check out this CrowdRise campaign. Go check out Barefoot College, even just to visit their website, barefootcollege.org. And... Um, just go, just go see what they're doing. Go be a part of it. Maybe go visit, um, or uh, whether you donate your time or your money or, or something. You know, if you're looking for a project and you're listening and you're like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. How about maybe Barefoot College? Why not just commit to that? Why not just commit to going and doing something to help Barefoot College right here, right now? You can make this decision. You know what I mean? This is your comfort zone and this is where you want to go. Let's do it. Um, I think it's great. I think it's, <laughs> I just find it such an awesome, like, I, I respect you so much for, um, you're, you're just, you really, res- you, more than anybody I know, trust the path, even more than me, I think. I'm still more caught up in creating and kind of manifesting at times, and I, and I, it's working for me, it's, it's, I think it's part of, like, who I am as an individual, but you go about life with a calm and a, and a, and a path that um, is just so unclear to me as to where it's going at times. But it doesn't even matter because that's exactly why it's clear and that's why it's so awesome. Is that you're like, I don't know, I might be here, I might be there, uh, I might do this, I might do that. But as long as I am happy helping and supporting these things, then I will find a way. And, and that's kind of... That to me is like the description of Lawrence. That to me is like, I you know I always said that if there's one word I had to use for Lawrence, it's grace. Um, and I think that grace is something that you uh, really bring around wherever you go. Where do you where do you think if you had to kind of describe where grace comes from? I mean, I guess I guess I already know your answer, but where do you think? it can continue to, like, huh. What is the thing that br- <laughs> do you think brings out this grace in you the most? Um, well, first of all, I'm extremely flattered, honestly. And Mark, if there's one saying that they have here at the Barefoot College that I, you know, really hold uh, and I bring to Valhalla is that you're only as strong as the community that supports you. So mm-hmm. I'm only here because, you know, I was supported by my community, which includes you and everyone at Valhalla. Um, I mean, transcendental meditation is, is what I, I don't know, it's what I do. You just repeat a word over and over and over again. And 
have faith that you embody that that word. So yeah, I do sometimes, you know, over and over in my head say, you know, I will uh, take in willpower and I will exhale grace. I will take in love and I will exhale compassion. And you just say these things over and over and over again until mm-hmm. your subconscious is completely uh, absorbed by by this. Almost like you're filling yourself with this positive uh, ideas and positive lingo in a sense. And then that kind of is really what comes out of you when when in natural knee-jerk reaction, something happens and then all of a sudden you're like, and you, and you have to react. And most of us uh, in today's society would react with possibly screaming or yelling or profanities. And in your case, it's not to say that you don't get angry or mad, but man, at the speed that you catch yourself, the speed that you kind of say, hey guys, wait a second here. Are we doing this out of, out of fear or are we doing this out of love? You know, are we doing this out of kindness or are we doing this out of um, hatred, you know, and kind of the response is always, oh, the answer is always going to be love, right? In a weird way. And it's always going to come through education. And I know you started something called Educated Solutions um, without a clear vision of what you were going to do and how you were going to do it. But that's, you. I know you're part of something uh, like that. I know you know, one of the biggest facets of, of something that you are very much interested in is is education from the learning side, obviously, and then also from the teaching side. What do you, you know, where do you see the role of education in playing out? Like, do you think that's par- partially why you're drawn to Barefoot is because they are educating people and they're like, basically, they're an education center. Like, we can call them yeah, a they for-purpose are. business, but really what they are is at school. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, places like Barefoot and Valhalla and, you know, our, our, older, our older generation over at Sirius, I think these places really serve as like vessels of inspiration. So people go and they visit and it's not like a classroom where you're actually learning uh, tangible things, but it's what, it's what it, it, you take in and what you like, you know, what you feel after. Uh, and these are favors for the world. I think that they're, they're really valuable. Um, I rem- don't you remember, Mark, when we were creating committees for Valhalla, we were trying to structure uh, the organization in different committees like engineering and uh, permaculture. Mm-hmm. And, and then we, we had one for education, and it was so hard to put our minds around because we we're just like, but everything is education, right? It's like yeah. Everything is learning. Mm-hmm. So it's just we decided that it would just be an overlapping, um, Principle an overlapping everything. phenomenon. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. So I think in everything there's education. Right? We're constantly learning, but at the same time unlearning, which is just as important, right? Yeah, that's an interesting point. What do you mean by that? I, I know what you mean by that to some degree, but what do you like so somebody who's like speak more to that? So I mean the best example I can give again are these are these grandmothers. And everything that they've been told their whole lives was that to succeed you must be educated. And the idea of education for them was always told that it was in a formal school with uh, books and reading and writing and math are involved, right? So there's a, there's, a, there's a form of unlearning that they have to go through, like say, hold on, unlearn that because it's not true because here are some grandmothers that did it before you, so now you should do it, you can do it too because you're a human being just like they are mm-hmm. and you can, you can build a solar system without knowing how to read or write. What's amazing? So that, that's what I mean by unlearning. So, so I always had this idea for a long time, and I'm I'm not sure whether or not I still believe it, um, but I'm gonna just share it, which is that our mind is like a sponge, right? We've heard this before, that you can pour water very quickly on it and soak it all up, or you can drip into it one drop at a time, and it, that will actually allow it to absorb more of the water, right? So, like just quickly throwing the sponge in and out of the water out of a, in a waterfall is going to be very different than letting it kind of put, sticking it there and then letting the the water kind of drip into it and absorb and absorb and absorb and absorb. And I wonder which one is more powerful. It seems like the program, you know, being there, like, I wonder if like, okay, so imagine this two scenarios, Barefoot College has a program. They bring solar grandmas from around the world. Currently they bring them for six months, right? They learn over six months. They really get, get immersed into the culture of what's at Barefoot College in the village. And they, they get to experience something very different and remove themselves for a longer period of time. It could be argued that the, maybe that these people and solar grandmothers can learn it faster, right? Because then maybe that would have a better impact, better 
in this case being a, a, a quantitative thing, right? Not quality, but quantity. Saying, hey, what if the what if you teach more grandmothers? But but it, in order to do that, without expanding your facilities, you'd have to um, do it faster. You'd have to do it three mm-hmm. months or one month. I feel that part of the experience of the education is not the fact that you're going to throw the sponge in the water, the, 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 the waterfall, and then yank it out, and then expect that there is that much change. I actually believe that change takes time. And allowing that time to flow and that drip to go in and out, to go into the sponge, is very different than throwing it in. And I think that's the difference between real between what I call for-purpose organizations or NGOs. I think NGOs are just doing it like the waterfall method. They're just like, whoop, and they throw it in and out, and they're just trying to hit as many people as possible so that they have the the big numbers that uh, sensibilize more donors. Oh, we helped a million people around the world doing this thing. And Beerful College yeah. is probably like, hey, we've helped a couple of thousand people around the world. But the impact and the level of impact and the quality of the of the help is no doubt better when it comes from an organization of quality and for purpose and to me places like like barefoot versus like uh, i don't know unicef or whatever all these programs that are just all about numbers all about like how many people did we help so yeah do you feel the same way about that and um maybe we'll just end there and like give us your final hurrah about how how the quality of what is going on there and the quality of the experience of these grandmothers and, and these women who are coming to Barefoot? Um, I think it, you know, it's, it's every organization that gains popularity, that goes through the stress and the opportunity of getting bigger. Um, and Barefoot is, is seeing that right now, definitely, because its, it's story is being heard and we are a very small organization. We work out of a village, and we don't even have a main road to get here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think what's interesting is that it keeps its integrity by keeping the staff local. So, you know, I'm only here because I want to create, I want, I want my job to be obsolete. I want the villagers to be able to take it over. And right now, I would say about 90% of the work done at Barefoot is done by villagers from the lowest caste or who started among the lowest caste in India. They were taken in and they were taught how to, you know, do administration, accounting, communication, all these sorts of things. And and so the integrity remains with those people because they remember where they come from. And it has to stay that way for Barefoot to keep its 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 quality. I do believe that for sure. Um, and I see the measures being taken. You know, I see I see that they're keeping things local, they're keeping things with their villagers. Um, Whereas, you know, some other organizations might quick, and so they hire out all these, like, you know, big expensive uh, marketing companies and uh, PR companies, and they'll, you know, pay for really expensive commercials and whatnot, and all in an effort to just get bigger when what they're forgetting is the purpose of the NGO. So... Yeah, because it becomes yeah, a I think, model I think of that, like growth, you know, right? Oh, to sustain all these jobs that we just created, now we need to raise more money. And then raising more money creates this, this mm-hmm. pressure on a monetary side of what they're doing versus the actual purpose of what they're doing. And yeah, so uh, you mentioned something really interesting. So I think, like, I think, I think they... Yeah, mm-hmm. Go for it. No, I just, uh, so what I was saying is that I, I think they're going and they're doing things smartly. They're growing in a smart way. Uh, as you know, like, I'm, I'm one man. They hired a one-man marketing team for this uh, crowdfunding campaign. They didn't go to, like, some big uh, marketing firm from, you know, Silicon Valley or something like, you know, what a lot of other NGOs would do with a larger budget. Um, so that just holds to some of the truth uh, behind uh, the integrity that they have. And like I said, I want my job to, to be obsolete. I want someone else to, to learn it. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm desperately looking for the youth here that, you, you know, that will learn how to manage this campaign so I don't have to do it next year. Mm, and I, I know that yeah. part of the money that you helped raise, you were lobbying uh, them to say, hey, wait a second, you guys raise this money. Yes, you can bring more grandmothers, but also can you guys create, can we buy computers? Can we buy cameras and teach these people like themselves, the villagers that are already there, the youth that is already there, how to do exactly what you just did for them to help raise that money, right? And you, you've helped raise like 
I don't know, like almost $40,000 or something like that at this point or something, something pretty substantial. Um, but the idea is now you want to empower them to do it. And I, heard, I think you, I remember you telling me that they are getting those computers now because of the money. Yeah, uh, definitely. There's people already talking about getting cameras, like DSLRs, uh, similar to the ones that, that we use. You know, a lot of the times we, we know that we get gigs because we have these DSLR cameras. Absolutely. And so, you know, why not give it to the very, the very same Indians who need them so they don't have to, you know, hire us to come here and, and, and take all these beautiful pictures for them. Mm. So Yeah, I think that's... Um I think what you just nailed there at the end is the most important uh, piece of all of this is uh, it's more this money if you donate and you choose to donate whether you to donate your time or your money or whatever it is consider the fact that this money is really going directly into empowering people to do more than just the money that was put in versus the regular kind of non-profit NGO big organization where the money goes in and you have no idea where it's going this is going directly to bringing more grandmothers to the table um, it's going directly to bringing more people to um, to a position of power whether it be through computers whether it be through giving them a DSLR it's it's going to empower the barefoot village more and more and more and in turn all the other, you know, less fortunate villages around the world. So uh, I think we should just end it there. I mean, I think you've done a phenomenal job with the campaign. It's got a couple of days left. So for the people listening to this, go and check it out sooner rather than later. Uh, donate anything you can to help raise money for the cause. Every dollar you guys donate, there is some matching that is going on by the bigger foundation called the Skoll Foundation as well. So not only does your dollar have an impact, but it actually amplifies. And... Um, yeah, I mean, just be a part of it. Any closing, any closing statements that you wanna, you wanna go with there? Live like you're gonna die tomorrow, and learn like you're gonna live forever. Oh, That's man. all I gotta say. <laughs> that wisdom right there. All right, thank you so much, <laughs> everyone uh, who was listening. By the way, I never mentioned agency.vahalamovement.com. Go check it out. Barefootcollege.org. Also, go check it out. Um, let's make this happen. Let's see the change that we want to see in the world. I got to have to, have to use an Indian's quote on this one. <laughs> let's be the change we want to see in the world. Okay. Um, super nice talking to you again, Lawrence. I will see you soon when you're back in Montreal. I'm sure I'll talk to you before then anyway. And uh, good Christmas luck with the, the rest of the campaign. And uh, thank you, all the listeners who are here. Please like, share, subscribe, comment. All of those things help particularly on iTunes. I'm really trying to grow the amount of, uh, of ratings that we have on iTunes because it allows more people to see it. At this point, we are reaching, uh, I think we've reached like 60 or 70,000 listeners at some point um, on iTunes. So I'm, I'm kind of getting there, um, but I'm trying to, to make it grow and go further. Now that's across all the podcasts, right? So the idea is that we are trying to make this balloon into more and more so thank you very much uh to all of you guys who are listening out there and uh if you have any comments or questions for either i or lawrence about barefoot and valhalla uh, send us an email to info at and i'll make sure that lawrence or i get it so um thank you thanks for listening be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and don't forget to rate and leave a comment. Until next time, be the hero you've always dreamed of being.